Hey guys, Pie Guy Rules here, and welcome to every episode of Adventure Time Review Season 2. Adventure Time Season 1 was a decently sized hit for Cartoon Network, and shortly after Season 1 started airing, they greenlit a second season. In a remarkably fast turnaround, Season 2 of Adventure Time started airing only a few weeks after Season 1 had ended, and allegedly, It Came From the Nightosphere was only just barely finished in time to make it to air. And while I'm sure that was stressful for production, as a fan, it was great to get more Adventure Time right away. And that's all the background you need. Let's jump into the first review. Episode 27, It Came From the Nightosphere. Finn frees Marceline's demon father and has to mend their difficult relationship. Fun fact, this is the first episode co-written by Rebecca Sugar, a fan favorite writer on Adventure Time and creator of Steven Universe. It Came From the Nightosphere is, quite frankly, a really, really, really fantastic episode. I had a hard time picking a specific highlight for this one because Everything about it is good. I don't see a single flaw in this episode, believe it or not. The jokes are good, the memorable moments are good, the villain seems like this really big crazy imposing threat while also being funny at the same time. It gives Marceline a much deeper character than anything we've seen from her in season one. There's cameos from LSP to the Ice King to the Marauders. It also foreshadows a few upcoming plot lines, including Gunter being not what he seems. And of course, the Daddy Why Did You Eat My Fries song, which is something that's silly and lighthearted, but also exemplifies Marceline's deep issues in regards to her father. It wraps something very meaningful to the human condition in a light and goofy tone, which is basically Adventure Time in a nutshell. It's also Marceline's only major appearance in the first two seasons where she's not actively messing with Finn. There are so many memorable things about this episode. Marcy's dad's song about stomping on ants and sucking their souls. Finn talking about how the game that they're playing together is stop your dad from sucking souls. Ball. Marceline dropping the Finn bomb. And even the ending is memorable. Finn has had this pocket on his shirt the entire episode without any hint as to what's in it, and we finally find out that's where Jake's been the whole episode. On that note, this is the very first episode to not have Jake play a role. And that doesn't hurt it at all. Without having to focus on Jake as well, it gives Marceline and her dad and Finn more time to interact. According to the commentary track, the reason why Jake was not in this episode outside of the cameo is simply simply because there was too much else going on in the episode to include the other main character. And I think it's the right decision, as I don't really see anything that Jake could possibly add to this episode. Marceline's dad is the best villain in the show up to this point. He is wonderfully tied to the main characters of the episode, both being Marceline's dad, but also being someone that Finn himself unleashed upon Ooh unwittingly. He has this confidence and air about him. The first thing he does upon showing up is sucking out Finn's soul, and Finn is basically powerless to stop him. The only reason he stops is because Marceline asks him not to. He's one of those villains that is a friendly guy up until he decides to unleash all of the nightmares. And I love how dismissive he is of Marceline. It feels like a true father-daughter relationship, that he does care about her, but he doesn't respect her as an adult. And then on the flip side, when he transforms into a more monstrous appearance, he is nightmarish. He's a great villain, and it's kind of a shame the show doesn't end up using him to his full potential. And let's talk about Marceline. This episode firmly cements what her character will be for the rest of the series. Prior to this, she's just kind of the cool girl that plays pranks on Finn. But here, it's shown that she has deep emotional issues stemming from the fact that A, she's lived so long, and B, her father is definitely not great and doesn't respect her. It's also a great use of her loose moral code in the sense that she is more concerned with getting her axe back than she is with the denizens of Ooh. It's a really good time. This episode sets such a high standard of quality for this show that it's almost unfair that I had to review it first, as it's going to be really tough for any other episode in the season to stand up to this level of quality. Episode 28, The Eyes. Finn and Jake can't fall asleep because a creepy horse won't stop watching them. It's a bad venture time. Or so I thought. Just like this is the second episode of the season, this is actually my second attempt making this review. I originally reviewed it months ago because it was so early in the season. And when I did, I called it a bad venture time. However, while working on the other reviews and doing other things for the season, I got this nagging feeling like I was being watched by a creepy horse. 
my review of this episode didn't sit right with me. So I am striking that from the record, and we are going to start over and determine what rating this episode actually deserves. And let's start off with the negatives. For starters, there's some really inconsistent art in this episode. Finn is drawn way out of proportion a few times, and Jake's face is also drawn incorrectly in a few shots. Off-model isn't always a bad thing, but in this particular case, I just found it more distracting than entertaining or off-model for a specific reason. Another visual thing that I wasn't a huge fan of is how they portray night in this episode. I appreciate that the show has dynamic lighting and that they are trying to do something a little bit different in having everything be darker and very blue to symbolize that it's night, but it's too much blue and it's too long to see these characters drawn with colors that don't properly suit them. This is 100% up to artistic interpretation, but I feel like they went a little bit too far with that particular touch in this episode. And you know what? That's all the negatives. See, originally, I marked this episode down because of the comedy. I didn't think it was funny. But I think I've just seen this episode too many times. There are a lot of really great lines in here, and even if they don't make me laugh out loud anymore, I still think that they are humorous and deserve to be honored for that. The talk of poo brain and everything brainless likes music are just some of the very memorable lines from this episode. And the story, for what little of it there is, is actually good. I like the twist at the end that it was the Ice King spying on them wanting to learn how to be happy. You don't expect the show to throw out something so depressing. And it is foreshadowed at the beginning of the episode when Finn and Jake ruin Ice King's plans. And speaking of that montage at the start where Finn and Jake talk about all the things that they've done recently, I think that is the best part of this episode where you get to see a bunch of random adventures they went on like going to LSP's Quinceanera. It's also worth noting that this is the first episode to portray Peppermint Butler as potentially doing something shady. He calls Finn and Jake to deal with a goblin problem because there's a knocked out goblin on the ground, with Pep Butt swearing that he has nothing to do with it. But if you look very closely, it looks like he just tried to pull a prank on a goblin by putting a bucket of water over the door, and the bucket fell and knocked him out. So I don't know how evil that is, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Oh, and at the end of the episode, there is a fun little battle between Finn and Jake and the Ice King. I like how they avoid making it feel too similar to other fights they've had by having a bunch of goofy jokes like the Ice King pulling ice cubes from their freezer and arguing with them about why they don't have many ice cubes. It's safe to say that I had poo brain when I diagnosed this episode with Bad Venture Time. In in fact, it's going to jump all the way up to being a good time. While my eyes may not be in love with the visuals of this episode, everything else is spot on. Memorable lines, funny jokes, a cool montage, a good twist at the end, and a fun little fight scene. Also, they did such a good job at making that horse really creepy. Episode 29, Loyalty to the King. The Ice King adopts a new persona to attract princesses. It's really nice that the first part of this episode focuses in on the Ice King and shows us his perspective. He's just so very lonely and sad and pathetic. And he kidnaps princesses because he just wants companionship. That and he wants to take over U with his elite army of wives? The Ice King says this later in the episode, even though, to my knowledge, this has never been his M.O. I think the writers of this episode just figured that, well, the Ice King's a bad guy and all bad guys want to take over the world, so, you know, it's the logical conclusion of him wanting to kidnap a princess, I guess. But yeah, I like that this episode gives us a little bit more insight into the Ice King. This is also an episode of Cursed Images, by the way. If you ever wondered what the Ice King looked like without his beard, it is very strange. And even weirder, perhaps, is Jake and Vin with the Ice King's beard on. Very unsettling. It's not really a flashy episode or one filled with a ton of jokes, but I like the story, I like Ice King's perspective, and there's a lot of little touches I like as well. Like, fun fact, the castle that he just suddenly makes appear is actually built out of the sandbox that he was initially seen in when he goes to the park, and it's filled with a bunch of random playground equipment. I like that the episode doesn't even comment on this fact. If you're not paying attention, you might just not even realize that he has this whole sand castle built out of the dang sandbox. As far as comedy, I don't think it's bursting with jokes, but it certainly has a few funny ones. Like when Finn glues the beard back on the Ice King and tells him to fly, and then he doesn't. He just flops to the ground like a fish. And another one is when LSP offers to punch out her lumps in order to get the Nice King to be attracted to her. It is a really messed up scene, but it's just funny in how messed up it is. 
My favorite part overall, though, is the dramatic close-ups on the Ice King's face when he shows his true evil side. He looks very menacing. It's certainly not a standout episode. The story works, but isn't particularly flashy. And it's not the funniest of episodes, but I'd say it's enjoyable enough to be called a good time, even if it is relatively close to the meh line. Number 30, Blood Under the Skin. Finn gets humiliated for wearing a thimble and sets out to find less embarrassing armor. So the episode starts out with Finn getting a splinter. Oh god, no, not that splinter. No, no, no. This splinter is a much more minor and not horrifyingly drawn one. Anyway, I really like this episode. It has a very strong moral core. The challenges that Finn has to overcome are all related to embarrassment, including being in a public shower, getting treated like a baby, and doing, uh things with your butt. And of course, in the end, the day is saved by Jake, who is not embarrassed to wear lady armor, which, although it might look a little bit silly, is certainly more powerful than the incredibly impractical armor of Sir Slicer, the bully who's been following Finn this whole episode just to make fun of him because he's a bully. Slicer has a great design and this big over-the-top entrance, and it's so satisfying when Finn takes him down in the end. And aside from the great story, the jokes are on point too. This is one of those episodes that definitely flies past the radar in certain ways. The idea that the characters come across a ghost who wants to play a game that involves picking up a ball with his butt cheeks in and of itself just feels so wrong, but it's so funny. It's so out of left field and, and just so funny. Also, for some reason, my most private parts peeped by a boy is living in my head rent free. And speaking of lines, Jake has one about making the ladies think it was their idea in order to get them to do what you want them to do. Not gonna lie, that's pretty manipulative and messed up, Jake. It's a good time. Oh, and fun fact, this is Choose Goose's first appearance, and this character was actually supposed to be a lot more important and appear in a lot more episodes, but alas, it was not meant to be, and he was reduced to a much more minor role. Episode 31, Storytelling. Finn attempts to create a story in the woods to cure Jake of his illness. I'm not gonna lie, this episode's pretty messed up. For a few reasons, actually. Number one, most obviously, Finn forces two characters to kiss each other. And it greatly disturbs these characters because this kiss is incredibly unwanted. And it makes the one character feel like she has been tainted and no longer will be loved by another party. Even though the show treats Finn as in the wrong for doing this, it's still uncomfortable that this character who's supposed to be very heroic did this at all in the first place, regardless of his justification. And it's not even the action of making these two animals kiss that is in and of itself so wrong. It's the fact that the show portrays it as if it is a really high stakes, really bad, important thing that Finn did. The episode basically equates the kissing to something much more intimate, and therefore that being violated and forced upon them by Finn comes across much harsher than it should have, and this is the toned down version. In the original storyboards, this kiss was somehow even more grotesque. And secondly, on that justification, the entire reason Finn does anything he does in this episode is because of Jake. Now, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but I get the vibe that Jake is completely faking the fact that storytelling will have any impact on his illness. He is not under any sort of magical curse, and we do not actually see any tangible evidence that the stories have any effect on him positively or negatively. Jake just simply says that he needs a story to get better, and when Finn tells him a bad story, Jake says that he's getting a lot worse and that he's just going to die. It really seems like Jake guilt trips Finn into doing all these things for him by saying that he's going to die or be gravely ill if Finn doesn't do them. Even if Jake needed a story, the fact that he wants a story based on real life events also makes him feel incredibly demanding and bossy and pointlessly nitpicky over how he wants this to be done. This episode would make a lot more sense if Jake was actually cursed or there was some other magical thing in effect instead of just him saying, oh, you told me a good story, guess I'm cured. Maybe I'm the only one that got that vibe, but just the way the episode presents it, it really does seem like Jake is pulling all of this out of his butt, which makes the whole forced kissing thing even worse. 
Also, Finn contemplates murdering a bunch of baby birds. I know he doesn't do it, but just like the forced kissing, it feels really out of character here for him to even contemplate this. On top of all of that, I think the story of this episode about stories is really boring. Finn just kind of wanders around the woods, interfering with random characters' lives. It's not a story that has a very great direction, it just feels aimless. It's a bad time. The best part of this episode is when Finn falls ill at the end and Jake takes care of him. It's just like a sweet little moment, but it doesn't really make up for anything else that happens in this episode. I also like the name Boobafina. I think it's just nice and ridiculous. I guess I should also point out the fact that Mr. Fox makes his first appearance here, and you wouldn't think that this nondescript fox would be very important in the series, but trust me, for some reason this character is very important. 32. Slow love. Finn and Jake attempt to help a snail find love. Okay, I won't be talking like that for any more of the review, but honestly, that's what it feels like to watch this episode. It moves so slowly because there's not really much going on. And the main focus of the episode, Snorlock, is such an annoying character that it feels like this episode goes on for an eternity. The twist that he's a slug and not a snail? It's so stupid. Why would he be looking for other snails? Like, why would he think that he's a snail? Before he put the treehouse on his back, he was just a slug. Obviously. Fun fact, Snorlock is voiced by Biz Markie, and, I mean, his voice is fine, it's definitely distinct, but there's nothing else about his character that I actually enjoy. The whole idea is that he's not actively harmful, but he's just really stupid and too into his dumb love search to care that he's wrecking Finn and Jake's treehouse. I did find Jake's weird roleplay to be funny and memorable. It's so weird that it works. The idea that Finn and Jake's treehouse is under siege by snails grinding on Snorlock is definitely funny in concept, but by the time it happens in the episode, I'm just really bored and checked out on all of this. Bemo being rebellious is cute, though. But yeah, most of this is just Snorlock acting like a complete idiot in front of women. It's a bad venture time. I'm just not invested in this character. He is careless and disruptive and harmful to characters that are trying to help him. He's not sympathetic in any way. Therefore, I don't actually care what happens to him or about anything in this episode. Episode 33, Power Animal. Jake has trouble staying focused while trying to rescue Finn. Fun fact, this is the first episode to have Princess Bubblegum and Marceline in the same place. Although we don't yet know anything about their backstory. So my favorite part of this episode, of course, is Jake's very memorable dance. In general though, the art and animation in this episode seems to be of a little bit higher quality and detail than an average episode. Jake's movement when he laughs seems really detailed, and when Finn takes the helmet off in his fantasy sequence, the lighting is really dramatic and shaded very well. The story is simple but effective. Jake has trouble staying focused and is just kind of irresponsible, but in the end, his irresponsible partying is what ends up saving the day. It's a good time. It's not one of the funniest episodes, but it does have a few good lines, like Jake saying that he's going to eat cinnamon bun. But on top of that, it's a good story that works well with Jake's character, and it's just pretty to look at. Episode 34, Crystals Have Power. Jake decides to be non-violent while Finn is taken captive in the Crystal Dimension. So let's start with the things that I like about this episode. First of all, I love everything about the Crystal Dimension. I love the way the minions look, I love the way the backgrounds look. It all has this really amazing stylized appearance to it of different shades of blue and purple that I really appreciate. I also like that this is a sequel episode that follows up on the events of something that happened in season one. It's something that the show would definitely do a lot more of going forward, and the idea of connecting episodes that have very different plots but are still connected by some common event happening in one and then being followed up on in another one. It's an interesting way to have episodes feel connected while also standing alone on their own merits. The thing about this episode is that ultimately, it's kind of a rehash of a lot of other things that have happened in the show. For instance, we got the non-violent episode already last season. We did this exact same thing where, as it turns out, not fighting against evil in a world where evil monsters exist is not really a smart idea. 
Also, this episode is very similar to the one that aired directly before it, and was produced before it. But even taking out the fact that this is the second one to do so, Power Animal is a much better episode about being hopped up on magical energy and Jake struggling to rescue Finn. And on that note, there is a weird joke in this episode about how characters don't often get hopped up on magical energy. And that line is said by Jake, even though, dude, it literally happened to you in the last episode. You would be at least two Abraham Lincolns. Also, remember in last season's review, where I talk about What Have You Done being a good example of a non-forced mislead? Well, this episode is the exact opposite of that. The only reason Jake is conflicted at all is because his father worded something incredibly strangely for no apparent reason at all, and Jake, for some reason, just kind of forgot that part of the memory. It doesn't at all feel natural, especially because Jake should know that his brother was completely fine. That mislead only works for us, the audience who has not yet met Jake's brother, there's just so much about that storyline that doesn't actually make sense if you think it through. And according to the commentary, this episode was rewritten quite a lot, and that doesn't really surprise me. Also, fun fact, the flashback in this episode is inconsistent with the one we saw in the episode Tree Trunks. She only takes one bite of the apple there, and she's wearing the makeup still. In this flashback, she just doesn't have it on and ate the whole apple in one bite. On top of all of that, there's some really inconsistent looking art in this episode. Some of the stuff on Jake early in the episode looks very strange. He's just proportioned very oddly. And then in the one flashback where he remembers his dad, he kind of appears as this weird looking amorphous blob that just doesn't look good or right especially because the jowl surrounds his entire nose, which is not how these characters are drawn. And lastly, let's talk about the Quartzion Queen, or Tree Trunks, in this episode. Yeah, she's incredibly creepy. This old lady elephant repeatedly hits on Finn and calls him sexy, and it's just, uh, you know, uncomfortable, because she comes off like this grandmotherly figure that's definitely older than Finn, much, much older, and Finn is visibly uncomfortable by all of this. I understand that Tree Trunks was evil when she had the apple in her, but even when she spits it out, she still makes these weird flirty comments towards Finn that I don't find it cute or charming or funny, it's just uncomfortable. I want to like this episode. I think some of the crystal stuff works very well, and an episode about Jake believing that he's harmed people and so he doesn't want to fight anymore does make sense for his character, but they've just already done this storyline much better last season. And the way the story unfolds is just not satisfying. Especially because, at the end, all Jake does is just kick Tree Trunks in the stomach and she spits out the apple. We don't even really get that much of a fight scene. It might be apple pie time, but it's also a bad venture time. So we're over a quarter of the way into the season at this point, and wow, it's looking like a very inconsistently real good and real bad season thus far. Let's see if that trend continues. 35, the other tarts. Finn and Jake make poor decisions while transporting valuable pastries. Fun fact, the back rubbing ceremony is in the same location as the meeting of royalty in The Duke. So this episode is about Finn overthinking things and coming up with overcomplicated plans for what is ultimately just a very simple, straightforward mission. Honestly, this episode takes on a new light in recent times for me personally. In the real world, we have a lot of people who seem to be drawn to conspiracies, and they are way more concerned with some sort of boogeyman, hypothetical, maybe this could happen far into the future, that they can't even see that there's immediate danger right at their door. If anything though, I think having that perspective really strengthens this episode. It shows how someone can very easily get wrapped up in a story that they're telling themselves about something much more interesting going on than reality. Finn opts to go on the offensive with a group of shady characters because he thinks they might steal his tarts, even though they would never have known about the tarts if Finn didn't engage them first. And the only reason he's even around the bandits is because he thinks that the safe route will be dangerous and set with traps because of course the villains would know about the tarts and think to go to the safe route and trap it even though Finn has no evidence that this has happened. Of course it's good to be proactive and plan for the future, but never ever ever let your hypothetical fears of something that could happen let you decide against something that is the safe, smart option in the first place. 
But theming and lessons aside, I also think this is just a fun adventure with a neat little twist at the end. The beginning has this really cool stylized opening with Princess Bubblegum narrating just how important these tarts are and how big of a deal this whole thing is. And it makes this episode feel a lot more special than it really has any right to feel. And of course I have to mention the Tart Toter's really crazy, wild, epic speech at the end of the episode, which is just so bizarre that it, it, just, it just captures your attention. And my favorite part, yet another Adventure Time thing that just gets stuck in my head, is when Cinnamon Bun goes to transport the non-poison tarts, the path is a bunch of people saying, can I hold that for you, sir? In this kind of melodic way. It's sort of a song, even though it's not really a song. Also, that twist at the end reminds me a lot of Wet Painters from Spongebob and how Princess Bubblegum just literally lied about the stakes of the episode in order to get Finn and Jake to take it more seriously. I guess Princess Bubblegum is really the Mr. Krabs of this series if you think about it. Anyway, it's a good time all around. Episode 36, To Cut a Woman's Hair. Finn must get a lock of hair from a princess to free Jake from a witch's bottomless bottom. This episode reminds me a lot of The Witch's Garden, but a much better version of that story. They both have to do with crazy witches and Jake being punished. But this time, I love that Jake really hasn't done anything wrong, and yet he is brutally punished in this episode by the most bizarre and funny form of torture that they could have possibly come up with. He is being sucked into this witch's butt. It sounds so immature and stupid to say out loud, but the way it's done makes me laugh so much. And it's certainly not alone in terms of funny things in this episode. Here lies Princess Beautiful. She was so beautiful, but died of baldness. I also love LSP taunting Finn by demanding a ring out of him because he showed even just a modicum of interest in her. Third Van Ullman, who worked on the show and is creator of Flapjack, portrays the witch in the episode, and she's just so delightfully weird. She makes for a great antagonist. And it has a good subversion of a typical moral, in that Finn tells her that she's ugly because of the way she acts on the inside, not because of her baldness. And then when he kindly donates his hair to her, she decides to use his hair for evil because, you know, she's evil. And of course, this episode reveals that Finn has glorious golden locks of hair. It's a good time. It's got good humor, good story, a little bit of romance, and a witch sucking Jake up into her bottomless bottom. What more could you possibly want? Episode 37, The Chamber of Frozen Blades. Finn and Jake use their ninja skills to infiltrate the Ice King's lair. There's also a B-plot of sorts, which is kind of rare for an Adventure Time episode, in that the Ice King takes Gunter to the Doctor because something is wrong with them. I find this episode to be all bark and no bite. The idea of a ninja episode in Adventure Time sounds fun and interesting, but in reality, Finn and Jake don't actually do a lot here. It's mostly just them snooping, and what they find out about the Ice King isn't anything that's a big revelation. The only thing of interest is his secret ninja area, which is something that doesn't really come up much again. There's an episode in a few seasons about Finn and Jake hanging around a different character's house, and that one is much more funny and suspenseful. This one has a few jokes, but I don't feel it brings the right comedy for an episode that is basically about not much happening. On the upside, the playful ninja fight between Finn and Jake is actually fun, but it doesn't last that long, and there's low stakes because Finn and Jake are just goofing around with each other. The major fight of Finn and Jake versus the Ice King is something that happens off screen after the episode. It ends with them punching him and that's it. I understand that maybe that's the joke, the idea that we spent this whole episode basically building up to a big battle between the Ice King and Finn and Jake and then it doesn't actually happen, but eh, I just find this episode not that satisfying. I certainly don't hate it though. It's kind of charming that they find MS Paint style doodles on the Ice King's computer. And what majorly helps this episode is the subplot with Gunter and the Ice King. Even if the Ice King may have borrowed the freezing people in line joke from Despicable Me. But yeah, there's some funny stuff there like Ice King turns Gunter over and looks at their undercarriage to try to determine the sex before just giving up and throwing them. And like I mentioned, the ninja stuff we do get is kind of fun, there's just not enough of it. And because of all these positives and negatives, I'm gonna go with meh time. 
Oh, did you think I wasn't going to talk about the weird cat thing that Gunter gives birth to? No, I think we need to talk about this. Apparently, in the original storyboard designs, this thing was supposed to be a hybrid of the Ice King and a penguin. I'm trying really hard not to think about the implications of this, but fortunately, in the finished episode, we get the cat thing, which is definitely not anywhere near as gross, but still gets across the point that there is something very weird about Gunter. Number 38, her parents. Jake lies to impress Lady's parents with Finn suffering the consequences. This episode reminds me a lot of a certain controversial SpongeBob episode. It has quite a lot in common with I'm With Stupid. It is the almost exact same story. In this episode, Finn volunteers to help Jake impress parents. In this case, Lady Rainicorn's parents. But then, over the course of doing so, Jake pushes his kindness to the point where Finn is constantly getting hurt and degraded because of this lie. Where it differs from I'm With Stupid is that, well, it's just better. Because Jake realizes the errors of his ways, apologizes to Finn, and it doesn't go as overboard on the sociopathy as I'm With Stupid does. But Spongebob comparisons aside, what's not to like about her parents? We open up with a beautiful breakfast scene with light streaming in through the window showing all sorts of dust particles. Then we get a weird joke about Jake sending messages that beam directly into his brain, followed by the iconic line where Finn says that homies help homies, Always. Some interesting lore backstory, like the fact that Rainicorns are super prejudiced against dogs because of a war that happened. A silly music number. Fun jokes about trying to fool Lady's parents. And it all ends with a weird joke about Finn eating imitation human meat. It's a good time. And it's relatable. A lot of people have to go through the process of trying to impress their partner's parents because you want them to think the best of you because if the relationship's gonna work out, you probably have to get along with the in-laws. As far as episodes go where there is no true villain and it's not about actually adventuring, it's more laid back and comedy oriented, this one is one of the best we've seen so far. And every time I watch it, it just flies by so fast because the pacing is very good. We're always on to the next grouping of jokes. It never stays too long on on one thing, even though the entire episode takes place in and around the treehouse. Oh, and fun fact, when Jake writes his letter in Korean, he also mentions that he does not have a pet turtle. I think they just wanted to throw something really random in Korean in there. Episode 39, The Pods. Finn and Jake must figure out which of three bean pods is evil. There really isn't a lot to say about this episode. It has a few good jokes, like the knight instantly turning to dust and blowing away as soon as Finn accepts the quest. There's a bit of intrigue in that you are wondering what's going to come out of these pods and which one of them is going to be evil. And there's a bit of fun action with the ice cream at the end. The episode doesn't take any of these concepts to the next level. It is still relatively simple and straightforward, even with the twist that they missed the pod which was evil. But everything they do actually do in this episode does work. It is a good time. Just because an episode's fairly basic and simple doesn't mean it's bad. Fun fact, Finn's questions on the test include, are you bad evil? Do you have any allergies? And do you hate good? Episode 40, The Silent King. Finn becomes the Goblin King, but is beholden to strange customs. This is an episode about how difficult it can be to be a good leader, even if you have the absolute best of intentions. People are always going to be stuck in their ways, especially if something has been done for a very long time. And I really like the conflict here that Finn is trying so hard to help these goblins get over their irrational fears and their unusual attachment to all of these old-timey rules that basically only exist to punish them, but there is just not not much he can do to help them get over it. I also think this is a fun twist on the concept of once the bad guy is defeated, everyone is just saved and happy again. While that concept does work in fiction because it's simple and clean, the real world is often much messier than that. And taking out the big bad guy doesn't just magically make everyone's problems go away. And it's cool to see an episode that reflects that for once. And I like that the ending is basically Finn just letting the goblins rule over themselves because he puts Whisper Dan, a character who cannot seem to talk and doesn't have much of a personality, in charge. And 
Oh my glob, I think I just finally figured it out. Whisper Dan is the Silent King. I never thought too closely about that episode title. But yeah, the goblins get to just project their feelings and wants onto this guy and essentially be in control of their own destiny. I mean, hey, it's about as happy an ending as you can get when you have a bunch of characters who have been living under some sort of awful authoritarian regime and have internalized all of it. All that to say, I think the story is pretty great, and it's mined for a lot of fantastic comedy. It was a very clever decision to make the punishment that the evil Zergiok inflicted on his subjects be that he constantly spanked their butts in over-the-top ways and in situations that are horribly out of place. It gets across how evil Zergiak is in a way that's silly enough to be funny. There's also Finn's discomfort with having to have Gummy do things like brush his teeth and chew his food. Another great joke is that Jake's insides smell like vanilla because he was cursed by a wizard. And the only reason Finn knows this is because he jumps inside of Jake's mouth and wears him like a suit. <laughs> Adventure Time is such a weird show, and it's on display to great effect in this episode. It's a good time. Oh, and fun fact, for whatever reason, Jake's mouth moves during Finn's line about freeing the goblins. Some people suggested that this was Jake mocking Finn or an intentional joke, but honestly, I think it was just an animation error because his mouth and arm movements happen at the exact same time as Finn's. Although maybe it's a little bit of both, an animation mistake that they decided to include anyway because the people behind the show thought it was funny. Episode 41, The Real You. Finn puts on magical glasses that make him smarter to impress Princess Bubblegum. So the basic plot outline of a dumb character becoming smart, then becoming insufferable and obnoxious before eventually reverting back to their stupid ways has been done in a lot of shows. As far as I can tell, it's something that originates in the story Flowers for Algernon, but shows such as SpongeBob, The Simpsons, and Tiny Toon Adventures have all done takes on this basic plot structure. And I'm not really saying that to rag on Adventure Time, it's a story that makes a lot of sense for a lot of different characters across media, and it's always fun to see a dumb character acting smart. I really like Adventure Time's take on it. The episode's halfway over when the glasses even enter the picture. Finn and Jake try to become smart the old-fashioned way by libraries or going to worm school before Finn takes the easy way out and goes with magical glasses. I also really like the sequence when Finn first puts on the glasses and becomes smart, how it zooms in on everything really fast and utilizes some CG in order to make a fun little sequence there. Another thing I like is the climax of this episode. I think it's cool that Finn creates a four-dimensional bubble because he was blowing bubbles when he was stupid to impress Princess Bubblegum with his mouth, but now he is blowing a very sophisticated bubble, a bubble that turns into a black hole. And I think this episode really justifies that Finn doesn't need to be super smart because in the land of Ooh, it's more important that Finn uses his practical skills to throw himself headfirst into the problem and fight his way out of it. Some of the funniest moments are smart Finn saying really weird things like everything small is just a small version of something big or don't you see princess? We were all born to die. And I have to say, the design of Finn with these glasses on is just nothing short of adorable. I used to be a lot higher up on this episode, but breaking it down, I'm not super interested in Finn and Jake going to the library. The idea of Finn and Jake in this adventure world deciding to spend time at such a mundane place like the library is a good one. They just didn't hit on the joke as hard as I would have liked. But library aside, between the very strange worm school teaching theoretical phytonomics and some of Smart Finn's dialogue, the episode is still funny and memorable. It's a good time. Perhaps the most important detail of this episode is the fact that Finn loses his iconic gold sword, also known as Scarlet. And as we'll see later in the season, he gets a new sword, setting the precedent that throughout this series, he will lose and gain new swords as time goes on. I've always loved that about this show. It's a little bit of continuity in there that helps you tell what era of the show you're watching just by what sword Finn has. And it opens the path for a lot of really interesting stories to happen much further down the line. Episode number 42, Guardians of Sunshine. Finn and Jake enter one of BMO's video games. 
Going inside of a video game is certainly another plot line that has been done before in other shows, but that's just because it's a story idea that works so well. There are so many different kinds of video games and so many ways to do this sort of episode. I love the design of Finn and Jake in the video game. They could have just settled for making it CGI Finn and Jake, but the fact that they went the extra step in making them really blocky and stylized really shines through here. The game world is very plain. It is all green and it is basic shapes that make up the background. It would have been neat if they had done a more advanced looking video game that actually had more colors, but I think it works for what it needs to be. And considering Finn and Jake are animated so well and so lively in this game world, you don't really focus too much on how plain everything around them is. And it does actually capture the feel of an old video game, even if it does make the backgrounds a little boring to look at. In terms of the comedy, it mostly just boils down to one type of joke. The fact that at the beginning of the episode, Finn and Jake easily pass so many obstacles in the game, and then later when transported into the game world, just get utterly decimated by every single thing. How quickly Finn and Jake lose lives, and how freakishly scary some things in the game are. I think these jokes work phenomenally well, especially when they're about to fight Bouncy B, and then it immediately cuts to Finn being drilled into as he's screaming painfully because they are getting decimated by this thing. It always gets the biggest uncomfortable laugh out of me. And then there's Silly Sam, who catches me off guard every single time. I know he's going to turn around and scream at the camera, but the camera lingers on the back of him for just long enough to make you question when it's actually going to happen. Atmosphere is something they absolutely nail here. Fun fact, the binary in Finn's leg actually does translate to Finn's leg and hello world. It's an all around good time. Episode 43, Death in Bloom. Finn and Jake journey to the underworld to rescue Princess Bubblegum's plant after accidentally killing it. Man, the beginning of this episode really reminds me of Warmy. But somehow I don't think Spongebob and Patrick went to heck in their episode. Although it has been a while since I've seen it. Anyway, Death in Bloom is an episode that basically lives and dies by its location. Because the story is kind of... Neh? Nah? Like, Finn and Jake stupidly kill this plant, then go to the underworld, and then basically fail to save it, and the only reason they even come out of this adventure alive is because they mention that they know Peppermint Butler. And he's only appeared a few times before this, barely established to be a sketchy character. All I'm saying is the ending's kind of a cop-out, and the characters are only in this mess because they were acting like complete idiots. So what does the episode have? Well, that location. The fact that it's Finn and Jake running around this weird gray version of the underworld, complete with long panning shots that showcase what an interesting and dark location it is. There's a lot of good dark humor here, like the skeletons really wanting Finn and Jake's flesh, F and J saying that they died by being awesome, and of course the ending gag where Peppermint Butler says he's going to take their flesh when they're sleeping. I can't really say I'm a big fan of the fart joke. It's a little bit low-hanging, dumb humor. But I will also say that the Morrow joke, the fact that Finn thought that she meant tomorrow, but instead she just meant her bird called the Morrow, is an all-time classic Adventure Time joke, especially with Jake repeating it back slowly with the bird appearing in his mouth just out of complete nowhere. Oh, and fun fact. Princess Bubblegum's conference is a meeting with these same vegetables briefly seen in the Jiggler. And we still don't really know whether they're animate or not. One of my favorite moments has to be Death smooching Jake and then saying, Kiss of death, baby. It's just so weird and absurd to see this skeleton representation of death kissing our main character to restore his memory. I want to like this episode more than I do. I just wish it was a little bit better and a little less reliant on what is essentially a big cop-out ending. I like the subversion that Finn loses the musical battle, but I still think they could have come up with a better ending than that. But yeah, this episode is a good time. It's not really one of my favorites, but it's enjoyable enough to watch thanks to its beautiful scenery and dark humor. 44. Susan Strong. Finn believes to have found a lost civilization of humans. The nitpicky nerd in me wants to mark this episode down because, on a series-wide level, 
there's something very wrong about it in that Princess Bubblegum is not that concerned that her kingdom is under attack, and apparently all of her weapons are really cutesy and ineffectual, and she thinks that dressing them up like cute little witches is somehow scary and intimidating. The Princess Bubblegum from most of the rest of the series understands that her kingdom is under attack and is dedicated to the point of a character flaw, so dedicated to protecting her kingdom at all costs. The fact that she's not taking this seriously and her only measures of defense are just really silly doesn't make much sense. And there's not really a way around this. You can come up with some fanficy reason why she's pretending that her only defenses are pretty weak and pathetic, but I just don't buy it. That being said, this characterization for Princess Bubblegum wasn't really established until a little bit after this, so it's not really that big a deal that it contradicts things. It's just kind of a bummer to go back and see such an important episode in the show's continuity not really fit with what's established later in the show. Truthfully, there are a lot of connections with this episode and much later episodes. Like, this is the first mention of Princess Bubblegum's Uncle Gumbald. Finn also has the incredibly ironic line that grass can't hurt you. And then of course there's the obvious fact that this introduces Susan Strong, a character who will pop up not quite frequent enough for my liking, but every so often to provide the mystery as to what is going on with the humans in Ooh. But putting continuity aside, this is a good time. It has some of the positives of it came from the Nightosphere because, guess what, this is another episode worked on by Rebecca Sugar, including a strong and interesting female character, a fun little song that feels very much in the same vein as a lot of the songs that she would write for Steven Universe, and it's a fun adventure that showcases various elements of Ooh that we've seen before, like Red Rock Pass and The Dancing Bug. And even if I don't think it makes much sense in the wider scope of the show, I must admit the idea of the candy people being under attack by what Finn believes to be humans makes a lot of sense. Firstly, because Susan isn't a bad guy, she just doesn't understand the difference between candy and people. But on a thematic level, I like it because it's basically Finn's adopted family in the Candy Kingdom and Jake and Princess Bubblegum versus Finn's blood people, humans. Or again, what he thinks to be humans. And I like that Finn and Jake call each other brother at the end of the episode to solidify this theme and prove that even if Finn doesn't have blood relatives around, he definitely has a family in Ooh. It's not really a laugh a minute episode, but I love it when Susan falls over and Jake just immediately declares that she died by surface world germs. And the beginning of the episode where Princess Bubblegum keeps putting her foot in her mouth regarding the topic of Finn being the only human is also pretty funny. And I like the surprise at the end that they are not in fact Finn's family, they are Monsters Review's family. Heh <laughs> heh, 45, mystery train. Finn must solve a thrilling murder mystery located on a train. I've seen this episode so many times. It was one of my favorites when season two was brand new. The fact that I wanted to watch this one over and over again, even after knowing what the twist was, really shows just how good an episode it is. I like the jokes about how obviously creepy the conductor is, how clueless Finn is about solving the mystery, and once again, there's some great morbid humor in here in the fact that there are dead bodies just kinda scattered all about, and Finn doesn't really seem that bothered by it. I don't really have a lot to say about this one other than that I like the story. Jake fabricates this elaborate mystery as a surprise for Finn on his birthday. One thing of note is that this episode introduces Finn's second sword that he repeatedly uses in the series. It's named the Root Sword, and it's just kind of lying around on the train. I'd like to imagine that maybe it was Jake or someone else's gift to Finn on his birthday. Like, a part of the mystery was that Jake left that lying around knowing Finn also needed a new sword. But the episode doesn't explain that at all, so... Maybe not. Something that always annoyed me about this episode when I was younger was the fact that there is Spongebob background music during the scene where Finn is looking for clues. Being the Spongebob nerd that I was, it always stuck out to me and I couldn't really focus on the scene, but I was thinking about, is this the song from Spongebob? Why is this here? How did it get here? And only now, thanks to the wiki, do I know that Nick Carr was the music editor for this episode and also the composer for that Spongebob song. My opinion on it has come down recently, it's not a phenomenally crazy episode, but it has a really satisfying twist and is a fun little story set on a train. It's a good time. <laughs> episode 46, Go With Me. Marceline and Jake give Finn advice on how to ask Princess Bubblegum to go to the movies with him. 
When this episode originally came out, I wondered if Marceline knew what she was doing. If she was intentionally messing with Finn because she knows Princess Bubblegum doesn't like this stuff, or if she just genuinely thought every other girl liked wrestling with wolves and other wild stuff that she's into. The episode never makes it clear. Marceline spent most of her previous appearances messing with Finn, so it would make sense that she's messing with him here, but she never reveals this to him at the end. She doesn't apologize for messing with him. She just feels bad that her plan didn't work. And I've wondered that for a long time until we got Adventure Time Distant Lands Obsidian. And I will be spoiling a little bit of that. So if you're watching along with me, skip this review. The context that Bubblegum and Marceline used to date, along with the fact that their breakup was very, very tumultuous, definitely means that in this episode, Marceline was messing with Bubblegum, and by extension, Finn. Or maybe she wasn't trying to mess with Finn, but trying to look out for him, steering him away from Bubblegum, who she thinks is bad news. This is further backed up by the one interaction these two have in the episode in which Bubblegum is not happy at all to see Marceline. I just think it's really neat that this one episode is completely recontextualized thanks to something that happened way, way later, and the two of them being romantic interests probably wasn't planned at all at this point in the series. But it totally works and completely enhances my enjoyment of this episode. But even from the perspective of watching this for the first time, it is nice to finally get an episode that clarifies that Marceline and Princess Bubblegum do know each other and don't entirely get along. Also, she name drops Princess Bubblegum's first name is Bonnabelle. And as an episode premise of Jake and Marceline arguing over how Finn should woo Princess Bubblegum, I think it works. It's funny to see Finn fall for both of their bad advice. And the episode has a beautiful backdrop. The first scene takes place at sunset, and most of the rest of it takes place with this beautiful purple starry night in the background, as if sunset is just perpetually occurring. And the characters' colors aren't as muted when they're outside as they are in the eyes. So I think it's a much better use of dynamic lighting, with all of the benefits and none of the drawbacks. Another distinct touch of this episode that I like less is Marceline's look here. I don't really mind that she has half her head shaved, but for whatever reason, the way she smiles and like her eyes contort in this episode just doesn't look right. The absolute best thing about this episode though is the split screen shot. The shot of Marceline secretly being in a pile of clothes behind Jake as he's calling her. They split the screen and they show her sneaking up on him from a slightly different angle. It provides provides a really cool looking effect and looks like something that was very hard to do, so props to the artists for pulling that off. Unlike that terrible movie at the drive-in, this episode is a good time. I also love how this episode really subverts a rom-com cliche. In a lot of other love stories, Finn would realize that Marceline's the one that he's in love with and should have been with this whole time. But in the episode, even though they make it seem like that's where they're going, all Finn really wants is someone to go to the movies with. So it leads to a nice misunderstanding where Marceline thinks that he's coming on to her. Also, her line about no tongue makes me laugh so hard every time. Episode 47, Belly of the Beast. Finn and Jake try to save a group of partying bears from a monster's stomach. Here we have Finn trying to help another group of characters who are really hard to lead. In the Goblin's case, they were sympathetic because they were more traumatized than anything else. That seemed to be what their motivation was. The bears here are just kind of too stupid and obsessed with partying to heed Finn's warning that they are, like, literally being digested, and therefore are much less sympathetic. There's this one bear that's concerned about them being digested, but he just disappears from the story. There's also the poor monster who gets his mouth all blown up and has to eat trees in order to try to chase off these bears, but he doesn't get to talk and he doesn't really get a personality. Even though I am much more sympathetic to this guy than the bears living in his stomach, and I wish Finn would actually help the monster, who's definitely more of a victim in this than anyone else, and is actively trying to resolve this situation. Otherwise, the only featured character in this is Party Pat, who is an utter nothing 
nothing of a character. His appearance is based on Pat McHale, who worked on Adventure Time. And while that's a neat little Easter egg, it doesn't do anything to make this character less boring. He's played by Andy Samberg, which is a big shock to me, because I would have never known that unless I looked it up. The character sounds almost nothing like him, and Samberg is known for being a lot more upbeat and full of energy with his roles and jokes, and Party Pat is just not that. You would think a character named Party Pat would be someone who is loud and off the walls and really exciting and interesting, but no, he speaks in an almost monotone voice that is more likely to put you to sleep than get you amped up to party. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe it's supposed to be a joke, but it doesn't work. Also, Party Pat using the monster's heart as a waterbed makes me feel uncomfortable inside. There's a lot of things about this episode that are repetitious and bland. Party music and flashing party lights play through a good chunk of it. And then there's the dancing bears, who are in the background of many shots. Problem is, they are dancing on a loop, and the same dance moves are used in multiple different shots. It breaks the illusion of animation because you can tell that they are just on a loop and not performing in organic action. A little looping is fine, but the bears are all over this episode, and the loop that all of them are on is fairly short. Additionally, the episode doesn't lead to anything. Finn and Jake and the bears escape through the butt, but we don't get to see it because, well, I guess that would be too gross. And then the episode just ends with Finn out of nowhere getting the idea for the bears to use lights when partying inside of the monster instead of fireworks so they don't burn up his mouth. It's very anticlimactic. And it also doesn't solve any of the other problems. The bears are still gonna get digested and Party Pat using the heart as a waterbed has to be uncomfortable for this thing. This episode stinks more than butt intestines. It's a bad venture time. My favorite part of the episode is Finn and Jake's sad, slow country song, which is a cool concept, but not really super funny, and it's a very low energy, slow song, when this episode sorely needed something big and exciting to happen. Episode 48, The Limit. Jake stretches himself too thin during an adventure in a labyrinth. Ah, now this is a cool episode. We had a dungeon episode last season, so this season we get a labyrinth episode, which is basically just a dungeon and a maze put together. So we get the fun of having a bunch of various obstacles like scorpions and golems and all sorts of other stuff that Finn and Jake have to overcome, but with the added wrinkle that Jake is continuously stretching himself too thin. I love the idea of seeing this character push his powers to the absolute limit. You always wonder, well, how much could Jake stretch? Is there a limit? And as it turns out, there is. It also has a pretty straightforward message about peer pressure and how you shouldn't give in to it. And I love the visuals of the labyrinth and of Jake's body stretched out all over the place. Reminds me of that one episode of Cat Dog, Dog Come Home, where Dog stretches their body to the absolute limits going all over the place. I guess yellow orangish dogs are just stretchy. Another iconic thing about this episode is the ancient psychic tandem war elephant. It's so weird. I, I don't know where they came up with this, but it's a great goal for Finn and Jake to want to get. And I love that Finn wishes for something that he can then use to wish for another thing. It's very clever. I think one of the funnier moments is when Jake has basically used up all his energy and then comes back to life one more time and then says, that's it, I'm dead, before flopping back over. Oh, and I have to give it up for this one shot towards the beginning where we see Finn and Jake in front of the labyrinth and it just pans across it and it's just, mwah, chef's kiss, beautiful. It's a good time. And fun fact, did you know hot dog nights were immune to poison? I'm really giving you guys the inside secrets here. 49, Video Makers. Finn and Jake run into creative differences while making a movie. So I get the impression that someone involved in making this episode has a passion for amateur filmmaking. Things like trying to make a movie out of random clips you film, arguing with your friends about the direction you should take, trying to get people to do what you want them to do even though they're not professional actors. These are all very relatable things to anyone who had a camcorder growing up and wanted to be a filmmaker. Unfortunately, even though the passion shines through, this episode is not very good. Which is something it actually has in common with a lot of amateur films. It's like Finn says himself in the episode, he's not engaged. 
I am also not engaged. It's just a bunch of vignettes of Finn and Jake filming something. And the main conflict, Finn and Jake arguing over creative differences, doesn't feel that big or important. The audience knows that Finn and Jake are going to make up by the end of the episode, but their argument and fight should feel real. It should feel like something that could maybe continue into some other episode or be bigger than just a very minor disagreement. But it doesn't. It feels like a shallow conflict where the characters make up almost immediately after fighting. One thing that might have gotten me more invested is actually seeing what Finn or Jake's vision for this movie was. Because as it stands, since we just see random clips, we as an audience have no way to form an opinion on whether Finn is right or Jake is right. And the resolution is that no one was right or wrong. They should just be friends. It makes the conflict feel very arbitrary and pointless, and therefore this episode is boring to watch. This certainly is very common in creative industries where you work with other people, but the way the episode portrays it is just not very interesting. A lot of the comedy in this episode is also a bit simplistic, like someone will fall down or Finn and Jake have to chase a frog around in circles. I did not find it funny. On top of all of that, this is basically just storytelling again. An episode about the characters stumbling around trying to make a story out of random things they find in the woods. It doesn't work in that episode, and it doesn't work here. Adventure Time will have plenty of other episodes about the nature of creating something artistic, and we'll judge those as they come up. But as far as season two goes, both of these stories about storytelling really just fall flat. I'm sorry, Bimo. Even though your song was very cute, it just wasn't enough to save this episode. It's definitely a bad Adventure Time. The one cool thing I can say about this episode is that it does introduce the term the Mushroom War. Jake specifically mentions it in context of these tapes being from before the Mushroom War. Now, throughout the series, even in the opening, we see various normal everyday objects from today's society littered all around Ooh. Things like street signs and remnants of subway stations. So there was always background hints that something had gone on that changed society forever. But this is the first time we get a hint as to what that serious thing that happened might have been. And I think it's neat how they slip in all of these little hints as to what happened to the Land of Ooh before we finally get it revealed. But more on that in future seasons. Episode 50. Mortal Folly. Finn and Jake must stop the Lich from reaching his well of power. This episode is suspenseful. It feels big and grand like an actual adventure. Finn and Jake even mention it's the first time they've set out to save the world. It is nothing short of epic, even though it's only 11 minutes. And it does all of this while not missing a beat in terms of comedy and just the fun goof around feel that Adventure Time has. Just like it came from the Nightosphere, Mortal Folly raises the stakes. In the series pitch bible created by Pendleton Ward, it point blank says, the Lich King is not funny. Yeah, he used to be called the Lich King. They changed it apparently because World of Warcraft had a character called the Lich King. Anyway, I love that in this episode they stick to it. There is nothing funny about the Lich himself. He is very creepy, intimidating, and serious. The comedy in this episode comes from the Ice King, and the fact that the Ice King is trying to do a typical kidnap the princess storyline, while Finn and Jake are busy trying to do a the world is about to be destroyed by the ultimate evil storyline. It came from the Nightosphere had a villain who is both intimidating and goofy, but this episode has a goofy villain in the way of the Ice King and a serious villain with the Lich. And the fun juxtaposition of Finn and Jake trying to shake off Ice King's usual ineffective goofy fare in order to focus on the much more serious threat at hand works phenomenally well. I think because they have the Ice King in it to be the comic relief, it helps keep the Lich serious. They don't have to give him jokes because all the jokes get to go to the Ice King and it still remains a funny episode. The only real critique I can give this episode is that it does lean on the true love conquers all cliche, where the only reason Finn is able to withstand the Lich's power is because he has a sweater that Princess Bubblegum made for him, which Finn interprets as love. It's not necessarily a bad trope, it's just a little cliche and a little corny. I typically like my resolutions to have a little bit more explanation than just 
Love Conquers All. But it's not that big a deal here because the characters do still go through pretty tough trials in order to make it to the point where the sweater can resist the Lich's power. And the sweater only makes Finn resistant. He still is very proactive in defeating the Lich. In a pretty fantastically brutal scene where he brings the sweater through the Lich's eye holes and rips his skull apart. Fun fact, Finn and Jake's gauntlet dock from Business Time reappears because they go to the same lake that they were at in Business Time. It also explains why Finn is not afraid to go on the water because it's a lake and he's only afraid of the ocean. Fittingly, this episode calls back to the Enchiridion. In both episodes, Princess Bubblegum decides to share something secret with Finn. It's fitting because this and the next episode are supposed to be the season finale to season two, and could have potentially been the series finale if the show hadn't been renewed. And of course, Enchiridion was supposed to be the first episode. And I have to talk about the snail's involvement. The fact that the snail has been following Finn around means that he was able to get to the Lich and free him when Finn went up to where the Lich was locked away is honestly really clever. I, I just really love that detail because the snail has been there. It's been foreshadowed that this snail is around all the time and you think it's just a little Easter egg and it is, but then all of a sudden it becomes incredibly relevant. The episode also mentions Billy again and of course his hero was the first appearance of the Lich in small cameo role. So yeah this episode really feels like a culmination of everything from the first two seasons. Referencing and calling back to several different things. And lastly I have to talk about the ending. Now of course this is part one of a two-parter and the second episode did air immediately after the first one but even still the fact that this episode ends with the Ice King dropping Princess Bubblegum into the Lich's Well of Power and seeing the horrified faces on everyone is an incredible shock. It's not like the show is far into this concept. A similar thing happened in Tree Trunks, but even though it's not the first time they've done this, it still has a great impact and makes you really want to know what's going to happen next. Of course it's a good time. It's one of the best times of Season 2. 51. Mortal Recoil. Princess Bubblegum is acting strange after falling in the Lich's well. So a lot of the fun of this episode comes from the fact that Princess Bubblegum is possessed by the Lich, but Finn is just oblivious to it because he likes the princess so much. It's very funny to see the normally sweet Princess Bubblegum acting demonic, as are Jake's freaked out reactions to slowly discovering that there's something wrong with the princess. And story-wise, it's actually poetic that the Lich uses Princess Bubblegum and the fact that Finn likes her so much as a tool to further his plans, considering her liking Finn is what defeated him in the previous episode. It's neat to see Finn team up with the Ice King to take down a big threat, and there's definitely tension with what's going to happen to Princess Bubblegum afterwards, and it's paid off beautifully because it's pretty surprising that she turns into a 13-year-old, which is a pretty big status quo shakeup. And the very ending, where we see the Lich is possessing the snail again is wonderfully ominous. Fun fact, Princess Bubblegum's bathtub has like a duck or a swan head. It's a very weird background detail and I just wonder what was the impetus behind that design? It's not candy themed like so many other things in the kingdom are. As far as the episode goes, it's a good time. It's just not anywhere near as interesting or great as the previous episode. I don't really think there's a lot else to say, other than I think it's great that they drew the line with the Ice King that he is definitely not interested in a 13 year old. Episode 52, Heat Signature. Marceline pranks Finn and Jake, but her friends take it too far. I take issue with a number of things in this episode, starting with the fact that this plotline only happens because Finn and Jake are uncomfortable sitting on the couch, and Marceline says that it's an uncomfortable couch because she always hovers over it. But that's not true at all because both she and Finn sat on that couch, and neither of them complained about it being uncomfortable. Also, continuity-wise, didn't we just have an episode where Finn and Jake don't want to watch any more old movies because of the FBI warning? I know it's not that big of a continuity thing, but this episode has two things that contradict events that happened only a few episodes ago. Also, this episode is technically the season finale in airing order. Even though it was very much intended to be before Mortal Folly and Mortal Recoil, 
Thanks to Cartoon Network doing a last minute schedule switch, this ended up airing after it. Having this come right after the big reveal of Princess Bubblegum at age 13 is quite a letdown, I have to say. Some sources, like the official Season 2 DVD, do put Heat Signature before Mortal Folly and Mortal Recoil as it was intended. But I said I was going to review the show in airing order, minus sneak peeks, and so that's what I'm going to do. This is how we experienced it when watching it for the first time on Cartoon Network, and this this is the order that people discovering the show now on HBO Max and Hulu are going to see it in. And if you have a problem with me pointing out these critiques because of the way this episode aired, I do not care. I review things as they are presented to me, and for better or worse, this is how this episode was presented to me. As a lackluster season finale that directly contradicts two episodes that were very recent. I also hate the ending of this episode. The idea that Marceline can't do anything against the ghosts because of a rock, paper, scissors, Pokemon-esque type chain where ghosts are immune to anything she could do is really weak. The fact that she just shows up and does absolutely nothing, it, it doesn't make any sense. I know it's just kind of a dumb comedy thing. Surely there's at least something she could do. E even trying to talk the ghosts out of doing this could have been something. And they only get out of it because the ghosts want to watch Heat Signature, which doesn't solve the problem because presumably they'll just eat Finn and Jake's brains after watching, so it's kind of a non-ending. Basically, everything that happens in this episode just runs on stupid. And unfortunately, that extends to the main story. Finn and Jake want to be vampires, and Marceline tricks them into thinking that they are. For this plot to make sense, Finn and Jake have to be oblivious to the world around them. It's one of those stories. And those type of stories are only entertaining if they are very funny. As evidenced by the stupid ending, it's meant to be more jokey and humorous than a legitimate, interesting story. So when the jokes aren't landing, it's boring and possibly frustrating to watch these characters just acting like idiots. On the upside, I do like the guest stars. Brian Baumgartner, who plays Kevin on The Office, Kate Micucci, who will go on to play Sadie in Steven Universe, and Toby Huss, who I'm not really sure who he is, all do a good job with their characters in this episode, even though each individual one of them doesn't have a lot to do. It's a bad venture time. If I was given the choice between having my brain eaten and having to watch this episode again, yeah, I think I would choose to watch this again, because it would be really stupid if I chose to have my brain eaten over this. And that is every single episode of Adventure Time Season 2 Reviewed. And now, let's go to the bottom five. At number five, it's Slow Love, an uninteresting and forgettable episode. And at number four, it's Crystals Have Power. I liked the crystal dimension and the fact that it was a continuation of an episode from season one, but otherwise, it's a pretty nonsensical rehash of his hero. Number three, Video Makers. I can at least see what this episode was trying to do and relate to some of the amateur filmmaking vibes, but it doesn't come together as an interesting story. At number two, it's Belly of the Beast. I don't care about these bears, I don't care about Party Pat, and the episode is unremarkable in every way. And at number one, it's Storytelling, an episode that is not only boring, but also distasteful and doesn't feel true to the characters. And for the top five, at number five, it's Guardians of Sunshine. This one has big laughs, big surprises, and a very notable art shift for the first time in the series. At number four, it's The Silent King. It has all the Adventure Time weirdness you could possibly want. And at number three, we have Her Parents, the funniest episode of season two that's also backed up by good visuals, a nice song, a well-told story, and of course, a very memorable quote about homies helping homies. So you can probably guess what the two episodes remaining are, one from the beginning of the season and one from the end. It certainly wasn't the easiest decision, but Coming in at number two, it's Mortal Folly. The Lich is a very important villain to the show, and his first major appearance came out the gate and introduced him as the scary, serious bad guy that he is, giving us a very memorable episode. And the best episode in Adventure Time Season 2 is... It came from the Nightosphere. We still have a lot of episodes to review left in the series, but... It Came From The Nightosphere is one of the all-time best Adventure Time episodes. 
It has everything you could possibly want out of Adventure Time. Music, good story, continuity nods, great humor, interesting characters, and a really big threat that works on a smaller, more personal level with Marceline, but also as a larger-than-life monster to defeat for Finn. As far as recurring themes in Season 2, I only picked up on one, and it is that a lot of episodes feature very often used storylines, things that you see in other cartoons and just other media in general. Video game episode, Flowers for Algernon episode, Mystery on a Train episode. And I think it's a testament to how good everything else on Adventure Time is, that even if the story is something that I've seen a number of times in a number of other places, it still finds ways to entertain and shock me. Adventure Time is proof that there's nothing wrong with telling a story that's been told a lot, as long as you have your own unique spin to put on it. Now let's give a rating to Season 2. Breaking down the numbers, Season 2 had 19 good times, 1 meh time, and 6 bad venture times. Which is very similar to Season 1. And Season 2 is also a good season. I also think Season 2 is just better than Adventure Time Season 1. It's very similar to that first season in that, in most cases, it's trying to be a jokey show, but it takes itself a little bit more seriously. You have less joke morals, less episodes that end in a cop-out, and overall better story writing as a whole. It Came From the Nightosphere and Mortal Folly especially are episodes that show the potential that Adventure Time could grow into with bigger stakes, better character development, and more emotional resonance. All right, another season review in the books. I'd like to once again thank Andy for these fantastic PyCons, which are an iteration on Kuro's original PyCons. And lastly, thank you, the viewer, for being so patient and sticking with these videos. YouTube is not really a big priority in my life, so I can't get out videos too, too often, but I'm trying to at least do one Adventure Time season review every December. Hi Guy Rules, out.